Um, so, um, hi everyone. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, hi everyone. I'm Chen Chen. I'm a second year master student. Um, I'm happy to present my work on um, Aeronome Truncation, which is about locating and removing data errors during training. Um, I'm thankful to have my amazing collaborator, Haran, and my amazing advisors, Philip, Daniel, and Kenton on my team. Um, so let's begin with a close inspection of our data. This is from a summarization data set, Excel Sum. In the summary, it says that about 200 posts are to go at the boot site in Nottingham. However, I've highlighted some details in the summary that it's not well supported by the, by the input passage, actually. So there's no way in the input passage that you can find evidence that the two there are actually 200 posts and this event occurred in Nottingham because the only evidence I could find is probably is in the UK, but there's no evidence that it's in Nottingham. So it's actually like, um, there's some details that are not supported by the input text. We call them hallucinations. We also take a close inspect of our um, machine translation data sets as well. This is uh, ex extracted from the OPUS and IWSLT as well as WMT data sets. So there are many like types of errors, including hallucinations where the output is not well supported by the input, like incorrect capital letters. Um, you need to com um, compute in intrinsic um, metric conversion and uh, all sorts of errors. But the ultimate research question that we would like to ask is that, how does the data errors affect, affect model training? We look into this and from a theoretical perspective, the vulnerability of maximum likelihood training. So the loss function of standard training, I've, as I've written down, is just the sum of negative log likelihood um, loss of the individual tokens. If we take one step further and calculate the gradients with respect to a single token, we can see at the denominator, we have the predicted probability. And then at the numerator, we have the gradient of the predicted probability. So this indicates when the predicted probability is small, and also that when the token is noise, this leads to a large gradient update to an undesired direction. So I no noticed that I highlighted two parts, when the predicted probability is small, and also the token needs to be noise. Later, we will see that when the predicted probability is small, it does not necessarily indicate that, that the token is noise. So how to solve this vulnerability? There has been mainly two ways to solve this. The first way is a very hard way to truncate um, high loss tokens. This is called loss truncation. It's basically very simple here. It's just hard removing sentences with high negative log likelihood loss. And uh, we only keep the high probability data, truncating out the low probability data. However, um, loss truncation can also be done in a soft and fine-grained way. Instead of hard truncating the data, we just reweight each, um, each token by its predicted probability at the numerator here. However, the predicted probability of the tokens are not accurate at the beginning of training. So to compensate for the fact that um, it's not accurate during the beginning of training, the authors of this paper introduced a smoothing factor, and they they extensively tune the hyperparameter gamma to get the good result. However, there's a very core limitation associated with only using the negative log likelihood loss of indicating token quality. In this case, we have three examples right here. All three examples have the same predicted probability indicated by the little blue bar. Um, they have, so it necessarily means that they all have the same loss. However, only the first two examples are errored well, I, uh, however, only the first two examples are queen tokens, whereas the third example is an error. We can see that the predicted probability can be small because in the first case, you have a high entropy context. This leads to a diluted pro predicted probability of the ground truth token. In the second case, um, the model has not learned a proper distribution over the tokens so that it learns to assign uniformly to all the tokens. This also leads to a diluted pro predicted probability of the ground truth token. However, in the third example, the model is certain confident that the, uh, that the token is actually incorrect. In this case, Baltimore is, is an incorrect uh, continuation, whereas Annapolis is a correct. The model learns to do this because it assigns a very high probability Annapolis. So the question is that how can we incorporate loss plus skewness of distribution over the non-target tokens? 
Um, our solution is very simple. We use the error norm, which is the predicted probability minus the one hot target, and we take the L2 norm between this. The L2 norm has a very nice property. It's actually capturing not only the loss, but also the predicted probabilities over the non-target tokens. In the first two cases, uh, in all three cases, the loss equals to one. However, only the third case, when the model is certain confident that the error, uh, that the token is an error, we have a large error norm. So when we truncate by error norm, we have we only we are only truncating the third example, believing the first two example in the training data. Intuitively, we are just truncating the uh, the data where the model is certain that it is wrong. There are some very nice properties of the error norm. At the left, we we can see that the error norm only gets larger after initial warm phase. This is um when we pre-train a GPT-2 large model on Wikitext 103, and we plotted out the, the largest 10% error norm of data in each mini batch. So we can see at the beginning, there's a sort of warm-up phase. And after the warm-up phase, the model has learned a proper distribution. Thus, it learns to assign very high um, error norms to the noisy tokens. At the right, we have like a comparison between the, using the loss to indicate token quality and using the error norm. We manually annotated 300 examples from the GigaWord summarization data set, and we anno an annotated the exact token, which is um, uh, hallucinations. We can see that the loss provides a clear distinguish between um, clean and noisy examples, but the error norm provides a more cleaner um, distinguish between clean and noisy text. There's some experiment we did in the synthetic. Uh, we injected some, some synthetic noise in machine translation data sets. This is from the Opus uh, 100 uh, English French data set. So at the first table, we injected um, uh, untranslated data we, where we just directly copy from the source to the target site. This has shown to be a very like harmful type of noise from previous research. And it turns out our method is quite robust to this kind of noise. Uh, compared to the MLE baseline, our model achieves like a very large improvement, especially when there's a lar lar large noise levels. At the bottom, we have a table on we injected misorder um, target site data. So we randomly shuffled the target site. In this case, we can also observe that our method achieves better performance than all the other baselines, as well as achieving like a high improvement uh, when there's a lot of noise. At last, I would like to show that some of the are real real world data sets. We pre-trained a GPT to large data, uh, GPT to large model on the Wikitext 103 data set. So we can see um, on the table here we have um, we plotted out the performance as well as the um, variance of our me our method and uh, as well as the other methods as well. We can see that our method achieves the best performance while also achieves the lowest variance. This is kind of desirable because we don't need to try out um, uh, multiple times to get the best performance. Um, thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. You've been fast, you've used uh, eight minutes. So we now have seven minutes of questions. You can ask very long questions. No? <laughs> <laughs> very complicated one, please. So at the beginning of training, all the all the data right here at the bottom left is the figure right here, all the data has like the same error norm. So we're not truncating anything at the beginning of training. After the model becomes po positive that certain data is incorrect, we are actually start truncating. So this actually is a clear transition from the warm-up phase where we don't truncate anything to the um the the non-warm-up phase, the where the loss kind of spikes. Thank you. Uh, there's one here, sorry, there's one first here and then yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you motivate this from the start as like producing knowledge errors and hallucinations. So do you see evidence? Like did you do any um so we didn't um so we didn't did any like um close inspection of um what are the types of errors that we located 
Um, but in our motivation, we we do have observed like this multiple types of errors in the training data set, and we don't do not like um provide a clear distinguish between different types of errors. Um, it would it would be a certainly a very like good future direction to like, like take a close inspection and uh, classify the different types of errors and see which type of errors that this method finds. So your primary evaluation is yeah, my primary um is a uh, downstream performance basically. I think um I'll I'll answer first. And then um, maybe my co-authors has something to say. So from my perspective, I think this is a very fine-grained version of locating and removing errors. Um, there's also other data cleansing methods, such as um, you do some corpus filtering, you do some deduplications on the training data set. I think this can be like an upstream, like when you after you clean these corpus according to some heuristics, and afterwards during training, you apply our method to um, do a more fine-grained version of cleaning. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. So yeah, a lot of the children are going down to find the same Yeah, I think should be easy. Yeah, do you mind if I do examples beginning with the small one? Um, this one? Um, yeah, uh, I was just wondering, I mean, uh, what if you were curious and like what fraction of the, you know, the text in your corpus, yeah, but believe incorrectly the false report to capital Maryland. I mean, it sounds like you might be skewing the probability to get the correct answer, but then that might impact other types of queries kind of about, you know, the relative probability. Um, so if I understand correctly, your question is that you're interested in like, if I looked in the corpus and see how many of the data is actually agreeing with Baltimore and how many data is agreeing with the map yeah, about calibration. So I think our method relies on like some sort of distribution over the training data. For example, if there's 10 like instances of this correct is Annapolis and only one instance is um, this is Baltimore, um, the model learns to predict, okay, this is Annapolis and instead of Baltimore. But when the when the data itself is very noisy and when uh, the majority of data agree this is Baltimore, our method might fail. I think this is um, a important limitation of our method is that we we actually rely on the the consensus of the data to make a prediction of uh, which data is clean and which data is noisy. Thank you. Yeah, very quick comment. Mm -hmm. Picking up on Mark's comment earlier, you should look at the error because what I'm thinking is. If there are situations where there is an answer that is majority correct, a word that's in the right position, and a small number of times it's something else, which is also correct, <laughs> but your model just hasn't picked up the necessary context yet, then you'll keep filtering those out and never learn that in some context there's a different answer that's correct. So you should look at what is well. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have another comment on, um, I think this is actually something I've been thinking about. Um, some people say that noise is actually beneficial for model training. Some people say that noise is actually harmful for model training. So you kind, you kind of need to find the right amount of noise, the magical amount of noise, in order to get the good performance, I think. Like, if you have a sentence like Paris is the capital of the state, that's still completely different. It's either correct or that's true yeah this is like the limitations of the auto aggressive we don't know like what's after the word so like if this is like um paris is the capital of spain we would correct spain instead of paris um, okay so we need to finish is uh, okay, I don't know if I can make a question. Uh, yes, uh, okay. Uh, so, 
There, there's a lot of uh, past work on uh, like Bayesian approaches to cleaning data. The usual assumption is the data comes from a mixture of the true model and a garbage model. So what you refer to as the target and the non-target tokens, and there's a hidden variable uh, for each token that says which model it came from. And you can try to estimate that by EM. Uh, so I was, uh, and you could, the garbage model could be something fixed, you know, like a uniform distribution, or it could be something you learn to learn what kinds of noise show up. Uh, and I was trying to interpret what you were doing in that context. And I, I was failing, I think, because um, your, your method seems to have this weird property that if the true distribution really is 90-10, you can't learn it. You're always going to be throwing out the 10% case in favor of the 90. Um, so I think that is, uh, you know, maybe a deficiency of the model in less real languages like that. Uh, and it is maybe an interesting point that uh, children tend to regularize errors in their parent speech in the same way. The uh, classic example, which a lot of people in the room will know, uh, is when you have deaf kids uh, learning sign language from their parents who are not native speakers of sign language. Uh, the parent will do something 90-10 or 70-30, and the kid will regularize it to 100-0, just thinking that the language is kind of rule governed. Uh, that like if there, if, if something is possible in a setting, then it's like one. So for grammaticality, that makes sense to me. For factuality, it makes less sense to me. Uh, in that there really are circumstances where like you know ninety five percent of the people like chocolate, but let's say a little love for the people who like chocolate flavor. I think that is true. Like if the true distribution is ninety ten or even ninety five five. Um, our model is not able to learn it, but it's also on limitation of previous work that truncates on high loss sentences as well. When the predicted probability is, is low, we just throw them out. I think this is um, kind of the limitations of like, we need to recognize which part of the 10% is noise and which part of the 10% is actually from the true distribution. Yeah, and an interesting question actually is whether there are contextual clues to that. Like there have been other noisy tokens in the same sentence or from the same speaker. And so your prior on noise goes up or you know maybe there are other clues uh, that the data is thrown. I think maybe the models like uh, internal representations has some clues about this, but I did not look into them. Um, I think it will be a very interesting future direction to kind of make it more um, like studying the true distribution of whether it's 90, the 10% is, no, is noise or not. Okay. Thank you so much. Center, please. Yeah, good, good job. And we jump from the audience. A lot of Beautiful question. And look what we have here, the attendance QR code. Well, you, you know why? It's because yeah. uh, if you have three speakers, then that's more parents and grandparents to be in the audience. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly, yes. There's way more. But then I uh, think we should do more of it. Uh, yeah, everybody who needs to sign for attendance, uh, getting this credit, please use the QR code. I'm not sure if the rest are like what the other someone said, I don't know if the rest of the people really need to sign in for anything, seriously, but, but well, that's just in case. Okay, now the right, can we start with the talk? Yeah. Good, so Lin Fan, uh, thank you, you have 10 minutes, uh, and uh, you can start. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Lin Fan, I'm a second year master here, and I'm so glad to share my recent work the trickle-down impact of reward consistency on IOGF. So this work was done with Tencent AI Lab and Daniel. So I'm really thankful for their advice and suggestions. So this paper is about IOHF. So what is IOHF? So it's reinforcement learning from human feedback. It's a three-step strategy for uh, LM alignment. So in the first step, we have a kind of prompting data to fine tune a larger learned model. And then step two, we'll train a reward model, which is try to imitate the human preferences. And uh, in step three, we will use our algorithm, for example, PPO, to train the larger learned model. So in a summary, the, the essence of IOHF is depend on to step three, which is guided by a reward model. So the score from reward model serve as the only supervision proxy in IHF like 
So how, how can we train a reward model? So basically it's quite simple. It's like um, you get a human preferred responses given instruction and also a non-preferred non responses. And then train using a pairwise ranking loss to train the reward model. And uh, there's an open question right here. It's like, what kind of reward model could benefit the result of IOGF? In this work, we propose uh, a benchmarking strategy called contrast instruction. So basically, given a gold standard instruction response pair, for example, here, instruction A, what does RAM stand for in computing? And the response, the, the, the golden response is like random access memory. So we use some retriever to retrieve a semantical, semantically similar instruction back, like instruction B here. It's like, what does ROM stand for in computing? Along with its golden standard response, like read-only memory. So what we are doing next is like to mismatch the instruction response pair, like combinate instruction A with response B and combinate the instruction B with response A to see whether a well-trained reward model could classify them. So we based on this benchmark, we define two metrics like response consistency and instruction consistency. Response inconsistency measures whether a model could, given an instruction, whether a model could recognize what is a better response and what is not. Although these two responses, they are so similar in the, in the semantic space. So for instruction consistency, it's like given a response, whether the model could find a better instruction that uh, corresponds to the response. So, Let's see whether the, uh, the reward model can recognize them. So basically the reward model, we use Llama 7 billion to train a standard reward model and uh, it performs random guessing in these benchmarks. Like it couldn't recognize or classify these cases at all. So while, while they have uh, over 70% accuracy on the original benchmark. So, which means they have a lot of difficulties when uh, handling the cases in contrast instructions. So, uh, also when compared to human performance, they also have a huge gap um, compared to human performance. It's like if you use single task training for reward model training and also multitask multitask training for reward model training, this uh, these training techniques are uh, useless in facing contrast instructions. And we try to use some advanced uh, te techniques using current reward modeling. It's like from Lama to Team, the margin loss. So margin loss doesn't help in uh, alleviate this phenomena. And also we use some model ensembling to tackle this problem. And the result turns out to be they didn't, they didn't work. And also we changed the architecture of the reward model. And uh, we can see from here, the enco encoder only model like Roberta and the decoder only model like Llama or encoder decoder only, encoder decoder model like Flan T5. All of them failed to um, perform well on contrast instructions. And uh, even we use some advanced data augmentation technologies. It's like they also failed to resolve this problem. Uh, so the only thing that is effective is like training the reward model with contrast instructions, which is quite reasonable. Uh, reasonable. So, so overall, this paper is something like a first try to like uh, challenge the day LLM design through a pure data centric way. So it's kind of like um, um, what kind of data should we use to train a good 
a good reward model that benefits IHF process. So I think it's, this paper is also provides a signal that uh, challenge the current uh, reward modeling paradigm. So since OpenAI use OpenAI tries to convert this ranking problem into a binary classification problem. So it's like using, uh, trying to make a trade-off between the uh, feasibility of the uh, annotation and also the uh, accuracy of the modeling strategy. Uh, I think that's all. And, oh, oh, there are, we also investigate the trickle-down impact of the consistent reward model. We have a consistent reward model and an inconsistent one. So we use them to get to our RHF processes and uh, conduct human evaluation on this, these two cases. And as we can see, there are pairwise preference and uh, individual acceptability of uh, to RHF model. So basically we can see that with, with a more consistent reward model, the final IHF model um, have better performance. So that, that's all, thank you. So I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you again. We have seven minutes. You used eight minutes. That's right. Any question? Um, my question is that um, this uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that um, by, when you're training the reward model, you kind of need harder examples than the examples that we need right now. Like uh, we need to like um, the examples are harder to distinguish. Yeah, since ILM targets like we need ILM to have a new more nuanced understanding towards word knowledge, right? So I think most of the standard reward benchmarks they are just kind of too easy to for the reward model. So so contrast set they have contrast instruction. I think firstly is automatically is purely automatic, and the second is like. Uh, it indeed provides some kind of more difficult um, data samples for reward model. I, I have a question. Yeah, but, um, in the well-known example you had for uh, what makes your attention and where you had a small string in instance, but there are other kinds of- um, Aren't you? So, yeah, so all you did is change the nature though. Are there other um, kind of similar to you know, like word replacements that have just more oh. specific? Yeah, so the there is one challenge in constructing this automatic benchmarks is like you need to guarantee that this pair is its quality is definitely higher than the other one. So if you're doing some augmentation on the instruction or some other on the response, it's very difficult to ensure its quality goes up or goes down. For example, even you add some typo in the instruction or response, the human preference will definitely goes down. But uh, for other augmentations, it's not uh, there is no guarantee. So we retrieved. Uh, a similar instruction, but non-identical instruction back and uh, replace the response with that instruction to response. So to ensure this guarantee is. Well, how do you ensure that uh, the instructions are similar? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. That the instructions are similar, but the responses are wrong to the-, to the Yeah. The so to uh, avoid these cases, we use uh, some retriever to set a threshold to avoid that the similarity is not too high. For example, the cosine similarity is like between 0 0.7 to 0 0.8. So to ensure to, to ensure that is a uh, non-equivalent instruction. And do you have any way of validating, even if it's a sm small sample of all of this, 
Yeah. Uh, uh, construct uh, 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 the instructor data set or, or subset that you use to validate that one more or less you're getting what you want. Yeah, so we, we conduct like human evaluation and also GPT-4 evaluation and uh, they perform pretty good on this instruction so they can recognize these cases, but for reward model, it's, it's really bad. So, yeah. Any comments? Any kind of comment about the presentation itself? Just you did a good job and, and really thank you for it. Coming and presenting your, your work here, I think is is, is great. Uh, just a, a, a comment from the perspective of someone who doesn't work exactly in this. Some of us might get sometimes a little bit lost when students use too many acronyms all the time and, or present tables with results in which they don't indicate what that means, like CRES, uh, CINS, uh, are they, uh, evolve, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, maybe at the end of the presentation, you can write, oh, I think this might be this or that. But a uh, thing that many people might work in the thing you're doing and for them is, is they essentially see what that means. But many other people, let's say, how of the audience easily don't work on that, that people might get lost. This is a comment for everybody. This is not a criticism to you. You, did, you know, like that's how you want to have to do presentations by doing this. So this is, that's great, but uh, I recommend everybody to like think that there are going to be people working on what you're working and there are also going to be people attending that has never worked on what you're doing and maybe using a little bit of these acronyms, just directly defining more what you're using or even explaining the metrics you're using a little bit would be great. Yeah, thank you. Okay, no more comments? Okay, so thank you very much. And now we are going to see the third presentation. You need to share the screen, but it's yes. to be disabled. Okay. So we have now, uh, how do you pronounce it? Kaiser? Kaiser? Kaiser. Yeah. Kaiser? Okay. So with this here today, so we're going to introduce her work in collaboration with people at Beta for what I see. And the yeah, other minutes again, if you I mean you really have almost 20 minutes, so I'm gonna bet this, but you can do whatever you want, okay? But not longer than 20 minutes. For sure. But, yeah. Um hi Rob, I'm Kaiser. I, I, you probably don't know me because I live in the coffee room. I'm a first year PhD student and I'll be talking about my work when I was in uh, an AI resident at Meta on assessing concurrence across compositionality benchmarks. Oops, why does it quit? Okay, cool. Um, so the research question that we are trying to answer in this paper is how different data set design choices impact the conclusion about compositional generalization. And our findings, if oversimplifies into one sentence that those compositionality benchmarks doesn't quite agree with each other, even when they share the same notion of compositionality or data separation type. And this is the core figure from our experiments. I'll talk about it later. Compositional generalization, because this is a this is a lightning talk, I will just briefly um explain that. It can be roughly understand as the ability of the model assigning new meanings in assigning meanings into new inputs. And for example, suppose the model knows how to jump and turn left separately, it should automatically understand how to jump twice and turn left as the composition command. And so for experiments, we select six different modeling approaches, including the pre-trained and not trained from scratch ones, as well as a specialized architecture designed for composition knowledge generalization. We use four different data sets. For each of the data sets, we split them with different compositional, compositional splitting strategies. With those data set splits in hand, we compute and analyze the concurrence between each pair of the resulting splits. The method we use concurrence is from a previous work that can be loosely interpreted as how do the data sets agree with each other. And in our settings, we set a threshold for high concurrence to be larger than or equal to 
0.7, and you can find more details in our paper or in our prior work. And the the figures on the on the right hand side show right hand side shows an example of low concurrence values where the status that do not give the similar model rankings. So um, we go back to this huge heat map. Each of the cell in this heat map represents um, concurrence value between the data set pairs. And in general, we can see that the agreement between the pairs are not really high. For the higher values, um, it should be the dark blue ones, while the white ones as well as the red ones are still, still exist a large amount of space in this figure. So what could be the case? Our first hypothesis is correspond to the creation, cre creation type of the data sets. So maybe the data sets that's created by human have a better agreement between each other. And we find that, yes, it is the case for the natural data sets that are created by human have a higher agreement, the concurrence with e each other. But still, we find that the average concurrence is only 0.54, which is still far from the threshold for high concurrence. So this is saying that the data, data set creation type is one source of inconsistency between the agreements, but not the whole answer. So the other stuff we look at is different definition of compositionality. This is defined by how we split the data set. And for example, we may split the data set according to lens generalization or compound divergence. And we find that, unfortunately, the source of the data set has a larger impact than the, than the notion of compositionality, which is not very, not, not very well desired, because we, in the end, we want to evaluate compositional generalization instead of the source of the data sets. So what could we do to alleviate the consistency? So um, we look into the potential of lexical exposure, which happens for the pre-trained models because they have simply seen so many tokens during the process of pre-training, they may have an overestimation in terms of their performance in those compositional benchmarks, where if we just deal with these lexical items, and replace them with some kind of nonsense strings. This shouldn't affect any evaluation of compositionality. While we find that the performance of the pretend models has a drop if we apply this kind of replacement change. And this drop in the in the pretend models leads to a difference in terms of the conclusions obtained from the data sets. And the concurrence between the data data splits before the lexical replacement is very low. Before and after the lexical ex lexical replacement is very low, um, saying that the data set splits are get, giving a different data different model ranking after the lexical change. And we find that with this after dealing with the ex exposed lexical items, we get a more consistent model ranking from the data set splits. So this means that we have a sim at least we have a simple way to get a better better uh, conclusion from the data sets. In this work, we have only looked at the data sets from semantic parsing, and we didn't look at the other task scenarios. We also have only looked at um, pre-trained and trained from scratch models, and there are a lot more different evaluation settings. And then one side common is that the method we use concurrence in this in this work is computing it is quite expensive. It requires us to sample as many models as possible. And if you remember the heat map that I just showed, each of the cell requires us to train this model and train those all six models and with different random seeds, which takes a lot of GPU hours. So are there better alternatives? So for example, getting efficient benchmarkings or getting a more a better approximation for the agreement of the data sets. And finally, we conclude that we should be more careful when we are constructing evaluation sets. As a conclusion, we find that the, um, the compositional, compositionality benchmarks doesn't quite agree with each other. And the source can come from the data set creation type, there being either synthetic or natural, can contribute to the problem, as well as 
the source of the data sets has a larger impact to the conclusions from the data set than the notion of compositionality. But finally, we can uh, alleviate this problem, although still doesn't completely solve it, by replacing the lexical items with some randomly generated strings that doesn't affect other our evaluation of compositionality. And thank you. <laughs> If you're interested, you can follow my Twitter. I need some real human followers. <laughs> I don't need any bots. Cool. I think I can take questions. Good question. So when you look at the test sets for a lot of the benchmarks, you find that, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but very frequently there's like subcategories within the test set. So, like, in GeoGrade, there's like a subset of the, the templates. That you don't see that are of differing like characteristics like some tests, some etc. In in scan, you have some things that focus on repetition, some that focus on like other types of query. Uh, I'm wondering, even if there isn't high concurrency at a data set level, have you looked at like you would like cluster the individual items in the test sets? Would you find that there's like certain like uh clusters that actually have high concurrency with the sets? That's a really good question. I didn't look into it. So uh, what I did was mostly on the data set side and on the splitting side. Of all, I am curious that because we have different splitting strategies, maybe the splitting can be similar to how we cluster this data samples. But yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have an answer for that too. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not very familiar with a lot of these test sets. Um, it's a very English focus. Like uh, let me go to the data set. Yeah. Sorry, what was your question? Oh, um, this is mostly in English, mostly. My question, follow up question would be kind of with this, would you see similar sort of patterns with the results across languages, or is this problem where only certain languages more exposed than others? Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, those data sets are mostly in English. Right. and. Um, and I do know that there are some other empty, empty compositional benchmarks that might be used where they are in other languages, but I didn't try other languages. Okay. This is the limitation, but I think that would be interesting. Oh, and, and if we're replacing the lexical items, we are sort of low key transferring it into some language that no one can, can understand. So maybe that's related. Okay.